Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Mindgasms. I've got Peter Salmon back again, author of the book about the post-structuralist philosopher named Derrida called An Event Perhaps. Check out that book. And um, we first got connected over your uh, article in Prospect Magazine. There's a book there, An Event Perhaps. Check that out. And uh, I have the link link uh, for the Amazon page to buy that in the description of this video like I did last time. Perfect. And we first got connected over that article that you sent me on Twitter from that you wrote for Prospect Magazine about, uh, I think it's called something like how um, Derrida and Foucault became the most misunderstood philosophers of our time. And, uh, and our first podcast was about how a lot of public intellectuals like James Lindsay and Jordan Peterson are misrepresenting postmodernism. And we talked about Husserl uh, the, the last time. And so I thought it would be interesting and fun to talk about the relation between um, Heidegger and Husserl at both as people and their influences on, uh, on each other in terms of their ideas, along with Nietzsche as well and Heidegger's thoughts on some of Nietzsche's ideas, and also, like I was saying before we started, um, in terms of them as people, um, how you were getting into before how um, Husserl was influenced by Heidegger, uh, but then Heidegger ended up kind of betraying him because he was a supporter of the Nazi party during World War II, and then that's a little bit of a similarity with Nietzsche because he was not a Nazi supporter at all, but his sister after his death heavily edited his work to sound as favorable uh, as possible to Hitler so that he could use this kind of like screwed up document um, in some of his in some of his speeches so and there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can get into because uh, you were talking before about how um, about how Husserl invented the field of philosophy called phenomenology and uh, Heidegger get, has some interesting thoughts on ontology, like his uh, difference between uh, capital B being and lowercase being, and his distinction between the ontic and the ontological. And he also talked about some of Nietzsche's ideas, like he criticized Nietzsche's death of God. And then Nietzsche talked about ontology and phenomenology as well. So there's some interesting kind of similarities and differences and crossovers here. So um, I guess to start off with, um, do you want to get just give a, a kind of a bit of a review of what phenomenology is and Heidegger's influence on Husserl? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first thing to say, of course, is that Nietzsche predates the other thinkers by thirty or forty years. So, um, so yeah, 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 Nietzsche came way before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, in the sense that he talked about phenomenology, he would have been using it as a as a much more loose term, um, as used by someone like Hegel and so forth. So it was it was a word within philosophy when Nietzsche was writing, um, but it came to prominence um, by Edmund Husserl, um, Husserl had a what I think is a, a, a brilliant idea and he thought it was a brilliant idea and a, a whole bunch of the continental philosophers have thought this is a brilliant idea which is to essentially put aside the question of whether the world exists um it's an interesting question um and philosophers are free to look at it if they wish to but if we put that aside he, he called it bracketing it um if we bracket the idea of whether it exists what philosophy should be doing he thought was actually describing how the world affects us, our experience of it. So philosophy becomes a descriptive act. So it's not, does the moon exist? But when I look at the moon, what's going on? What do I see? What do I feel? Um, what am I? What is the phenomenon doing? Um, Immanuel Kant had made this distinction between Neumann and phenomenon, Neumann being the actual world itself, the real, which we actually have no access to, according to Kant and, I've, and according to Husserl as well. If you take a table, I have visual stuff from it. I might have taste stuff from it if I wish to, um, smell, so forth. But I can't actually know that there's a table there. There could be a, a small dog. I don't know. But if everyone agrees there's a table there, that's as close as we can get. You know, that's the table. So, so essentially what Husserl is saying is forget about the actual table and or small dog, whatever's there. Let's just talk about how it affects us. And um, phenomenology, therefore, was kind of describing the world, describing how we feel about the world. So there's certainly, you know, poetry and poetics and, and that sort of area, um, relationships, 
comes under under phenomenology but just do very basic stuff like how is time experienced you know he's not interested in objective time if we want to call it that you know the time of clocks um he's interested you know a bit but what he mainly wants to do is look at how we experience time how how we feel about time so he looks at things like duration um the passing of time um, is there a separation between consciousness and time maybe consciousness is just time our temporal experience of the world is simply what time is so he's interested in that um and spawns that you know a whole raft of very very interesting thinkers i think um and um one of whom was martin heidegger um heidegger is his student um and also he's kind of assistant and, and helps edit some of his books and writes forwards for some books and, and, and all of those sort of things fairly standard practice within you know the philosophical circles that someone would do that um and for certainly the first few years of their relationship they were very very close um and who still in a sense saw heidegger as the person who was going to take his project forward the most um heidegger was obviously brilliant you know in in many many ways and would turn out to be a very brilliant philosopher um so so their initial interactions were very very positive um and and that all started to go a bit wrong in the 1920s for both philosophical and personal reasons um which i can just dive straight into if you'd like me to or sure to. yeah so so well let's start with the philosophical um heidegger took the idea of phenomenology and actually let, let's go back to herself for one second one of the things that herself mm -hmm. had noticed was you're stuck with, in traditional philosophy with the, the mind body problem that descartes had identified or, or had spoken of trying to work out how the mind and body interact um and they obviously do and herself was was worried by the the cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am which mm. you know, is, is the establishing point of much modern philosophy. Um, Husserl, under the influence of a man called Brentano, a thinker called Brentano, had identified that we don't just think, we think about things. So we immediately have a relationship to the world. We think about a table, we think about mm -hmm. a, a friend, we think about things. So there's an aboutness yeah. in which Descartes hadn't identified. So Descartes, you can have a model of a brain in a jar. You know, you, according to Descartes, that is a, a feasible thing. You know, there wouldn't be any difference in the thinking of that brain in a jar to my thinking. Husserl said that's obviously not the case. And a lot of people like Merleau-Ponty and French philosophers have taken up this, this thought. So he was he was really trying to focus on consciousness and, and the way we ex examine the world. And he sort of thought that when, once we start doing philosophy, we think about the world in a different way. So... Whereas I would just encounter a table, when I do philosophy, I'm doing a scientific exploration of my thinking about it. So that was kind of one of his mm -hmm. jumping off points. Heidegger okay. then wanted to take this further. Heidegger yeah. said, well, not only is, is it, you know, once you do philosophy, you're thinking about things in a different way, but that's actually not how we interact with the world. And Heidegger, in a sense, thought consciousness was, was over, overstated. He thought a lot of our interactions with the world aren't actually conscious interactions so to take uh, one example if you're approaching a door which has a doorknob and you want to go through that door if you're being strictly philosophical you would experience your body walking up to the door you would see the door you would match it against other doors that you've experienced in your life and identify that's a door you would then identify that it has a doorknob you would know somehow that the doorknob is turnable you would put your hand out and you would experience putting your hand out turn the doorknob open the door notice now there's a hole there so you can go through that hole and then close the door and so on and so forth so essentially he's saying that that's how if we if we're being strictly philosophical in the way people have been philosophical in the past that's how we would go through a door that's not how we go through a door obviously we walk yeah up, we, go through, we don't course. even think of it we're, we're thinking about something else um heidegger's prime example is a hammer if you're using a hammer banging in nails as long as you're doing it and it's all going very successfully you don't think about the hammer the hammer is just in your hand another example is when okay. you're driving a car you're not constantly aware of all the, the of the steering wheel of the wheels of what you're doing it becomes part of your body um, yeah Heidegger mm -hmm. was trying to move even further than Husserl by saying you know we we actually inhabit the world in that way and when we're doing philosophy that is really very different to how we experience the world yeah um, yeah that's um just uh sorry just to uh dad there um that gets into his um 
Heidegger's distinction between the ontic and the ontological and his Don yeah. uh, Dasein rather or capital B being because like a, as you were kind of uh, illuminating in your examples um, when we when we're exam when we're examining what exists and human experience we can't escape our own perception as a human as a thinking thing like we can't escape our consciousness it's it's like you know how some people say if you're if you're a fish in water you don't know that you're in water because you only exist in water so you don't know that you're existing inside it so you can't you can't escape uh examining things from your from your own conscious mind and then like similar similar to what you were saying too when we do philosophy heidegger talked about it like a science because it, it's like we're do it's like we're doing this kind of like rationalistic exercise and we're it's very different from the way we live our lives just like yeah. instinctually like we can't escape the way that we exist in the world right yeah that's right absolutely so so to go to the hammer when do you think of it as a hammer you think of it when you miss the nail or you hit your finger or something like that you then it becomes the hammer again and the distinction you're talking about is he he made one between ready at hand ready to hand and uh, present at hand um these are obviously the english translations so when we're using the hammer it's ready to hand and that's actually how we how we experience the world as ready to hand it's there for us when we hit our finger or get angry at the hammer or miss the nail or whatever we then experience it as present at hand as just an object in the world and for heidegger that second way of experiencing the hammer is how philosophy has tended to deal with the world um, and this is where we get into ontology so heidegger makes this distinction um, between the ontological and the ontic now that second example when i'm thinking of the hammer as an object is an it's an ontic thing so he says philosophy has tended to look at hammers um concepts other people as objects in the world now when we're having this this conversation here i'm not experiencing you as an object in the world you know forgetting the fact that we're on zoom but you know you're a person with whom i communicate and we see each other's faces we have a you know and i'm never thinking well there's that object sitting there in that room um but he's mm -hmm. saying that philosophy has really struggled to not philosophy would be saying how do i understand that object that's that's over there that that andrew object how do i understand that so this was the distinction that Heidegger was 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 making between the ontic bunch of objects that we're we're amongst and the ontological which is actually how we experience the world and you mentioned his word das sein which means being being here basically or being there it's being here is probably closer so you are a, a almost a, a sort of hole in the universe that moves through things you are a being a point of being and he thought that the actual being with a capital b and in fact it's the first words of being and time the question of the meaning of being has been forgotten so he he puts this right back to plato he says as soon as plato starts to do philosophy then actually we're not then philosophy breaks free from how we actually live our lives um and there's a slightly sort of mythical element to it which we'll come back to when we get to nazism um where there's this this kind of golden age before we did all this stupid philosophy and thinking all this consciousness stuff where we just were in the world um, and actually, most of us still do that on, you know, on a daily basis. Those of us who aren't having conversations like this about philosophy, mostly we're just in the world. Um, in fact, one of his phrases is being in the world. That's, that's how we, 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 we exist. Um, and also we're thrown into this world. Um, and that's a, another key Heidegger term. We're thrown into a time and a place, you know, it's, it's the, the whole, partially that's the whole series of coincidences that have happened for you and me to be talking right from you know sperm and egg through to me being asked to write the book through to you doing a podcast through to you reading an article all of those coincidences and so forth so we're thrown into a time and a place and that is we're rooted to that place in some sense and the world we then interact with all around us um in in lots of you know fascinating or or boring ways um so Heidegger was doing phenomenology to an extent. He wanted to see what was going on in a human at all times, but a bit less about what's going on in the human mind and a bit more about what's going on in the human interactions with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, obviously uh, you mentioned Heidegger's being in time. Time was a, an interesting thing that he he focused on too when, uh, when you mentioned uh, Husserl. So that was perhaps um 
one of their kind of similarities too. Do you, um, do, uh, what is the what is the difference between how Husserl and Heidegger look at the concept of time? Hmm. I I, th I think they're they're actually I find them quite similar in that area. I mean, I think okay. again, Husserl it tends to be a lot more about the mind and consciousness. Um, he wants to really think about how we experience time. Um, the example he uses, a, he has this idea of, of there's there's no, the present moment is made up of both stuff that's come before, he calls that retention, and stuff that's going to happen in a, in a second afterwards, he calls protension. And the example he uses, and I think it's a very good one, is when you're listening to a piece of music, if you listen to a single note, you're affected by the note that came before that, and you're anticipating the note that came after that. So you don't hear every note in a piece of music as a completely discrete entity existing by itself. It's part of a tune. And that's how Husserl described the way that we do, that we exist in the world, that we're constantly you know, going forward through time and we're constantly carrying everything along with us. Um, Derrida picked out some holes in that, but we won't do that now, perhaps. Um, for Heidegger, again, it's much less about consciousness and it's much more about how we exist fully as humans within time. And spoiler alert, being in time is basically saying being is time. So we, we are an expression of time. Um, but we're also a, a finite being in, in theory, infinite time. And he finds that interesting, he, his concept of being towards death. So we die. Okay, unless, unless one of us turns out to be exceptional, then like everyone else in history, we're going to die. Now, that affects at every single moment what it is to be a human being. Okay, we would be doing very different things all the time if we knew we weren't going to die. Um, yeah, like if we were vampires and lived forever, exactly. we'd, we'd look at we'd, the world differently, right? Yeah, exactly, we'd look at the world differently. So, yeah, so there's a banal point that, you know, we'd, we'd go and try and do a million things and we'd jump off bridges and we'd, you know, do Groundhog Day sort of, sort of shit. Um, but there's also just a very fundamental thing. Yes, we would all of human consciousness would be different. One of the major things about human consciousness is it's finite and it's going to die and there's a part, passage of life. So that's that's one of the other ways in which time is is a huge thing for for Heidegger, that we, we are a, a finite being and we are a constantly finite being interacting with a whole of a, a lot of other finite beings. Um, you know, there's, there's some interesting stuff I was reading recently about often when we think about interacting um, and our place in the world, we think about spatial stuff. You know, I'm 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 here and 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 particularly in terms of other human beings. The other weird thing about other human beings is you have a select group who you are going to do this journey with at the same time as some of whom will die before you, some of whom will die after you, some of whom were present at your birth and thought, you know, isn't that amazing? Some of whom will be will mourn your death, some of whom may be happy at your death, all of those things. So there's this kind of group of people who who go right through the world with us. Um so that's that's much more sort of Heidegger again, trying to get it away from consciousness and getting it back into the world as he saw it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And uh I'm I'm kind of familiar I'm kind of familiar with um some of some of Heidegger's criticisms of Nietzsche like he was critical of Nietzsche's famous death of god you know the the old gods are dead and we have killed them in which i think he was actually kind of prophetic in saying that the you know the role of that religion plays society plays in society is decreasing and it's going to be replaced by something else and you could uh you, you could certainly see evidence of that in how but in how political tribalism has, or at least seems to have increased a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely. What, uh, uh, actually, that, I was going to ask you what uh, what Husserl thought about Nietzsche, because I'm not familiar with that. But uh, uh, what do you think about that in terms of uh, Heidegger's thoughts on Nietzsche? Yeah, I'm absolutely unfamiliar with how Husserl thought about Nietzsche. Um, I don't know oh, that he okay. ever met him. I mean, I think... One of the things about Heidegger is Heidegger, in a sense, brings Nietzsche back into the conversation. I mean, I think Nietzsche had kind of faded away. Well, I mean, or if he'd ever been part of it, you know, obviously he, he sold like three books during his entire lifetime. And and basically most of his books were written in a frenzy in the last few years before he went completely mad. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think that Nietzsche was a, was a major philosopher when Heidegger approached him. Um, and I think it's a really interesting sort of... Um, 
conversation between Heidegger and Nietzsche. Um, the, the first thing I want to say about sort of the death of God thing, which of course has become what Nietzsche is famous for in some sense, apart from um, what does not kill me makes me stronger, which I think Nietzsche would be utterly appalled by the fact that that has become a popular phrase and particularly how it's yeah. the <laughs> yeah. worst thing Nietzsche could, could imagine happening to his work. Um, but but the death of God, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things to unpack there. One is that, that in, in a sense, Nietzsche was just stating that we, we can have no certainties about a, a, you know, an afterlife. You know, again, in a similar way to Heidegger, we're a finite being. So, um, but he also had a, a sort of stronger take on that. Um, it, it's very easy to see Nietzsche as just an iconoclast, as someone who's tearing down everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I often fall for that trap myself, myself. And then you read him again. And the first thing to say is he's the best writer of all the philosophers. He's just glorious. Even when he's being nuts, he's, he's absolutely he's, a, cool. he's easy. He's easy to understand, uh, like is. way yeah. easier to understand than Heidegger and Husserl, for yeah. example, and, he, and, and, and many funny. others, right? Yeah, he's funny. He's irreverent. He's he's constantly turning things on their head. And, and you know, his insults are just absolutely brilliant. Um, but one of his kind of main antagonists, in a sense, was Christ. Now, when I say antagonist, I don't mean to defeat. I mean, someone he grappled with throughout his life. I mean, his father was a pastor. Um, so it, Nietzsche's problem wasn't necessarily with Christianity, although it was as well. Um, but he thought that... Yeah. What, yeah, like his book, The Antichrist, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But he, he was equally sort of um, hard on all religions, mostly because mm -hmm. they were failing in what they said they would do. You know, for him... The problem with Christianity was not Christ or Christ's teachings. The problem was it wasn't being lived as that. As soon as you started throwing words at Christianity, and you know, it, particularly in some of those particularly right-wing versions of Christianity going around at the moment, it, what Christ would think of them is unbelievable. But what Christ would think of you know a pope in a, a palace, or you know, so many of the things that have been done in His name, you know, Nietzsche was basically saying this isn't Christianity. You know, Christianity is mm. this, is that. Christianity, apart from anything else, should be problematic. You know, if you if you actually read the Gospels, it's weird stuff. You know, it's 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 parable, yeah. and it's strange, and it's odd, and all of those things. And Nietzsche's saying, you know, what God is dead because you know we're we're not doing what God does. You know, if you read the Bible, mm. it's batshit crazy and challenging, yeah, it's, difficult. especially like like some of the. Uh apocalyptic literature like the book of revelations where there's like a sword coming out of jesus's mouth and there's a three-headed dragon and stuff yeah, like that yeah, yeah yeah but also i mean just the stuff where where god contradicts himself as it were we'll, mm -hmm. we'll call him him for now but um you know god will suddenly be completely unjust you know job he punishes for no reason suddenly he'll change his mind about something now what nature is saying is this is actually incredibly insightful about the way that we encounter the world you know, it, we do encounter it as unjust sometimes. It is arbitrary. It is contradictory. It is confusing. And the problem has become that Christianity and Judaism and, you know, every, any other religion, they smooth over those contradictions. They, they, they try and make nice with it, as it were. And he was saying, you know, death of God, we don't, we, don't fear, we don't fear the world in the way that God should make us fear the world. You know, we don't extend charity in the way that Christ said we should extend charity. So, so all the death of God stuff mm. is very much picked up in in, in that as well um that's so a, that's interesting because like the way but like obviously people people totally misinterpret his famous the death of god thing mm -hmm. a, a lot and uh like the way you describe the way they misinterpret it often makes him sound like the most militant atheist possible mm -hmm. but the yeah. like his at least his motivation behind those sorts of things it almost yeah. sounds like like it's coming from a Christian motivation, like you're not being Christian enough, enough. Like it, it reminds me of Martin Luther's inspiration for eventually, eventually kind of starting the Protestant Reformation because he thought, you know, all these religious people and, uh, and all the things they've told me to do, I am, they're, they're not allowing me to experience religious revelations enough. So we need to change the church because all this corruption is preventing me and others from having these religious revelations. So it sounds like a really similar motivation. Yeah, yeah, I think that there are similarities there. I mean, Nietzsche did tend towards the hyperbolic, so you have to be a bit careful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Tend towards the heroic. So he, he, 
did he want he maybe wanted a world where it was all big clashes you know wagnerian gods fighting and people expressing their passions every time and uh, maybe he wanted that but what he was definitely saying was that's not how the world is now humans have been made smaller and smaller and smaller and more you know stuff like he he has these great riffs about history that we're just obsessed with history at the moment i actually posted something on twitter the other day about you know one of his spiels which just it's very like twitter he just says everyone has an opinion everyone's talking there's endless talking 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 and we're supposed to learn this stuff you know we have to learn and learn and learn and, learn and, and then talk more and stuff like that what about just being why don't we be what's the best way to learn by doing something you know by turning off everything and thinking and experiencing the world and what he says then is when you do that it's not the nicey nicey human you know you parts of you are a nice human but parts of you are jealous parts of you are angry parts of you are, are this and and that anger isn't just the yelling on twitter you know in in the language of twitter or yeah you know it is the passions that you have for life and he thought we'd lost the passions for life and he he did put blame christianity for this he, he thought that it sort of it had taken a meek version of, of humans and and put that forward now that may or may not be a good thing but for nature it was not a good thing um yeah that's it that's one of the that's one of uh that reminds me of one aspect of nietzsche that i like that he kind of that he kind of seems to share with um the post-structuralist philosophers who who we like like derrida and foucault and people like that like one of the things that i enjoy that they do is criticize kind of scientism and this of this enlightenment era over emphasis on the importance of rationalism and the demonization of the passions uh, like this do it's kind of like this dualistic mindset uh, all throughout western philosophy then you can go back even farther than descartes for that too like the intellect and the mind is superior than the body and the passions and this whole idea that yeah. pervades that realm of thought yeah, absolutely, and, and Nietzsche was was kind of the, one of the first philosophers, if not the first philosopher, to sort of say, well, rationalism is just a type of being in the world. You know, it's a type of dealing with the world. It has its valid aspects, um, although I, I'm not sure whether Nietzsche ever ever said that. But it, you know, it does have its validity, but it's not the only way of being in the world. It it may not even be the best way of being in the world, but it's certainly not the only way. And it is a uh, an ex a, a different thing to how we actually do interact with the world which come back to what we were saying about heidegger you know that that actually we don't do rational and you know one of the things that's interesting in the world at the moment and you know slightly terrifying as far as i'm concerned is that we we are learning more and more that rationalism and politics are separating and a whole bunch of stuff's being unleashed now i suspect nietzsche wouldn't have minded that um so you're not being a wishy-washy liberal like me um so he, <laughs> you know enjoyed that sort of stuff um but you know he he did feel that we we'd separated ourselves from our actual core being now this of course brings us to nazism uh if you want to go there now um yeah yeah sure i i just want to add before you could before you go there you were you were uh t talking about twitter i bet i bet nietzsche would like to would troll people on twitter just for fun. <laughs> yeah, I, bet, I bet he would be one of those types of people he, he had some real <laughs> resentment and also i mean he's he, the, the best aphorisms and of course aphorism is the you know the the precursor to twitter you know he, he could destroy you in 140 characters yeah that that, that that one of his books called um i forget what the actual book is but the subtitle is something like philosophy with a hammer where it's all yeah, those yeah, these yeah, short absolutely. maxims that yeah, are meant right. to be like take down things those are perfect for tweets yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and i mean what does not kill me makes me stronger he's one of is one of those yeah things. but he, I yeah mean, he was doing that with, a, with a serious purpose because um you know i i, I've re I read this about derrida that you know the way a person writes in philosophy also expresses their philosophy in some sense and and for nietzsche again there's this whole problem that if you write academically or you write very long arguments then you're doing exactly what he says is, is the problem you know you are you are it's better for him to actually be able to go bang this is what i think this is this is the moment of inspiration this is and i, I unfortunately I, I don't read german but if you speak to someone who does these are these are incredibly concentrated little poems as it were these 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 aphorisms that he writes they're, they're incredibly complicated and brilliantly done you know many see him as one of the great german writers for getting what the genre is forgetting its philosophy they just he is one of the great writers and you know when you read mm -hmm. in English, you do get that impression as well for sure especially if it, especially if you if you look at his his book um 
thus spoke Zarathustra because it's like yeah. a parable. It's not. It, it's nothing. It's not like a, a regular philosophy book at all. No, no, and it's, it's highly confusing, and it's it's one of those. Books yeah, where, you know, I feel like I got a glimpse of what what he's going on about. Um, but he is. He's he's doing what he says that religion should be doing, and no longer does. That speaking in riddles, speaking in parables, hinting at stuff, um, and having a hero's journey, as it were. So Zarathustra is a very confusing book, and I would recommend you don't start there if you haven't read any Nietzsche because we just go what is this shit um yeah <laughs> uh, but something like the Antichrist um is a, just a wonderfully witty easy to follow um beautiful piece of writing um and it is going you know I have one person who's uh you know worthy of my discussion I'm going to get into a dialogue with Christ so let's let's have it out you me and Christ um, which does give a bit of an idea of, of, of how Nietzsche saw himself, of course. Um, but he, he turns out he wasn't far wrong, <laughs> much to everyone's surprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, there, you could say you could say there there are some uh, similarities there, and maybe maybe delusions of or, of grandeur, which maybe yeah. contributed to him literally going insane at the end of his yeah. life. I mean, he's he's a really interesting case psychologically. You know, I, I'm always slightly resistant to to over psychologizing people because you know I think oh yeah yeah and everything. But you know, Nietzsche, um, he his books he was a, he was a very very intelligent man. Obviously, you know, he became a professor at 18 or 19, something ridiculous. It might have been 22 or something, but it's still ridiculous age of philology. Um, but basically, his ideas drifted from the mainstream. Um, his books didn't sell. He got he lost his university job um he's obviously having thoughts that are well he calls them untimely out of time they didn't fit into that time they would fit much more readily now partially because we've had nature um so he 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 was in a world of his own to to a great extent you know when you when you read any reports of you know interactions with him um i mean he did slowly withdraw because of illness and because of migraines and all sorts of stuff but everyone who spoke of him said he was lovely he was, he was delightful and shy and quiet and you know the politest man at the dinner party so he'd be incredibly polite at the dinner party and go home and write this you know extraordinary stuff about overthrowing all of society and the overman and you know competing with god and stuff like that um but because he was um not within society and you know he he did go mad um and some of his later works is, it's incredibly interesting where the madness starts and where the philosophy starts and where the, you know, the division between them um and i think for a long time it was just seen as the ravings of a lunatic um and mm -hmm. because it was so against normal philosophy and against normal thinking um and i think he was i think he must be incredibly lonely and and um once he goes mad tragically then sort of spends i think it's about 10 years in an asylum there's some haunting pictures of him in there um gone you know you know there was nothing left basically um so yeah incredibly fascinating figure and and but the, the he turned out there you know, four or five of the books in the last two years of his sanity and they're they're just extraordinary pieces of writing and, and incredibly challenging to any reader to anyone who wants to read him read him closely um yeah, but that brings us to Nazis, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It always, as always, must happen. So, um, I, I, just to, I, I said there were sort of two reasons for Husserl and Heidegger falling out, um, and this was the big one was was Nazism basically. So, so let's go with Husserl. Husserl was Jewish, born Jewish, um, but when he was in his early twenties, I think it was, um, maybe late twenties got married and converted and he and his wife both converted at the same time uh, both jewish backgrounds converted at the same time uh to protestantism basically so called um and then lived the next 40 odd years of his life 40 50 years of his life as a highly esteemed um philosopher you know invents this new school as it were uh he's a professor he has everything that goes with being a professor has acolytes and and he saw himself as a very um integrated um western european intellectual um and I, I don't think in any way he's kind of acknowledged his judaism at all not because he disliked it but you know it, that was that was what you became um and martin heidegger becomes his student and all that stuff and then of course hitler gets into power and hitler is not interested in distinctions about what you've converted to and your academic career and how it's all gone Husserl is now jewish and his wife is jewish and he is 
that there's no there's no way around that. Um, the university gradually withdraws support, ends up sacking him. Um, he has to move home uh, because that's requisitioned. Um, and the, these are, are shattering events in his life. You know, it's it's hard to underestimate how shattering they would have been. And you know, basically, had he not died early in the war, he would have ended up in Auschwitz. Almost certainly, it's hard to see how, unless someone got him out of there. Um, you know, and for someone who whose entire life was built on a certain image of themselves, for this to happen, it, it destroyed him. But the, the sort of icing on the cake, as it were, or even you know, a fair bit of the cake, was Heidegger. Um, Heidegger joined the Nazi party. Um, he gave a sort of notorious speech um, about, well, pro-Hitler speech, because um, he took over Husserl's chair when Husserl was cooked, kicked out, Heidegger takes over. Um, oh, I and, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, he's, he's nudged Husserl out. When Husserl dies, Heidegger says he had a cold and couldn't go to the funeral. I mean, he's a shit. You know, there's <laughs> uh, anyone who reads anything about Heidegger, if we're getting back to biography, Heidegger is just a shitty little man, I think, in many, many ways. Um, <laughs> no wonder <laughs> he great... looks so angry in all his pictures. Yeah, yeah. There's a great <laughs> passage in um, uh, The Existentialist Cafe by Sarah Bakewell, where she she's looking at existentialism, which also flows out of Heidegger. And Paul Salan went to visit Heidegger. Um, this is also very complicated. This is after the war. Salan's Jewish. There's a whole bunch of stuff about that. Um, and Heidegger went to the local bookshop and put all of Salan's books in the window. And Sarah Bakewell says, I'm including this anecdote because it's the only time in my entire research of Heidegger I've, I've read about him doing anything nice. And I think that's <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Wow. Um, so he does all of this. Um, and, you know, there's obviously huge repercussions for Husserl, for Husserl emotionally, psychologically, philosophically. Um, what, do, what do we do with this information about Heidegger? I mean, certainly part of him doing that is accidental. I mean, he's alive at that time. Um, you, you go with the flow. Uh, who, who amongst us can say we wouldn't have done so, et cetera, et cetera. It's all, all very good to say, yes, I would have resisted, of course. So part of it's accidental. Um, Part of it's not, of course, in the sense that, you know, this, this was a time where the West was seen as being in decline. You know, there's books like Decline of the West by Spengler. World War One has happened. Um, and I, it's, I think it's easy to forget because we just see World War One as a historical fact, how awful that was for everyone. You know, people were killing each other on a scale that had never been experienced before. If you're living in the world in the 20s and 30s, you've experienced that in, in, in a massive sense. The world had gone mad in many ways. Mm -hmm. Heidegger's philosophy, and uh, and like it was the first, it was the first war where people you people could use technology to kill on a mass scale bigger yeah. than they ever could before in history, right? Yeah, absolutely. And civilians were no longer outside of those targets. They 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 were still much more than they ended up being in World War Two, um, but they they you still had great civilian casualties. So it was just it was if you were if you were you know if we went to a world war right now. People like us would be going, what, what is going on? What, what, what's going on with humans? Humans have gone mad. They're killing each other for, you know, um, obviously we do have those thoughts about certain things now anyway. But, you know, it, at that time, for, for the intellectual class, in, and I'm sure lots of others, but for an intellectual like Husserl or Heidegger, the world has gone mad at this point. It's in decline. It's bar barbarity again. Um, and part of Heidegger's philosophical argument, of course, is that yes, we do have this terrible mistake going on in the world. We need to get back to where we were before. So in a way, Heidegger's ideas align with with this whole rebirth of the world. Unfortunately, the horse he backed was Hitler. You know, Hitler's idea of the rebirth of the world was different to Heidegger's in many ways. But there's analogies, and it's very hard when you when you're trying to unpack these. And you know, Derrida and, and other things have tried to do this to unpack which bits are the Nazi bits and which bits aren't. And it's very hard, you know. Heidegger after the war writes a lot about poetry, but talks about the return to the earth. You know, the, the we have to get back to our roots, which again isn't so far from Hitler with blood and soil. You know that, and you know Heidegger talks about you know the the working the worker, you know, and the glorious worker, and, and you know. It, working with their tools and stuff. Um, Hitler, again, sort of, it was na national socialism. So, you know, th there's that. Um, but mm -hmm. the final thing to say about it, I guess, is that what makes it really bad um, is Heidegger doesn't apologize. You know, after the war, he gives us, he gives at least one very major newspaper uh, 
um, interview, which wasn't published until after his death. Um, he fails to apologize. Um, he gets he gets a bee in his bonnet. Uh, that's putting it lightly about technology. <laughs> uh, um, uh, he, about the technology, and he, he says, you know, look at Soviet Russia. You know, the gulag system. They're killing people. You know, it's all machine stuff. It's all technology. Da da da. He doesn't mention the six million Jews who've been killed in the Holocaust. You know, he just glosses over that. Um, so he's never repentant in any sense. There's a couple of personal anecdotes about him apologizing to people like Hannah Arendt and, and stuff. Um, but he never actually has the bollocks to say, you know, wasn't that really shit. Um, so, so that's why, you know, it's very hard, therefore, to shake off the Nazi associations of, of Heidegger. Um, and mm -hmm. as brilliant as Heidegger is, there is always that very uncomfortable sort of communication between him and, and that particular way of thinking, which privileges the German spirit, which privileges, you know, the rebirth of the soul and, and all of those things and ignores the consequences of that. Um, mm. and yeah, I, go, I guess um, I'm not uh, I'm I'm not I'm not that familiar with uh, like, as you were saying, um, like the similarities and differences between Heidegger's and Heidegger's thought and Hitler's, like in in terms of uh, in terms of Hitler's thoughts on those sorts of ideas. I mean, the, I guess the the only thing I've read about that is I read Mein Kampf, which is a very educational book about like a, a leader's descent into madness, basically. But yeah. I, I guess I, I don't really I don't really think about that very mm -hmm. much, and um. It'd be it'd be interesting to see more of those uh, of those similarities because, like you said, yeah. he is a in spite of in spite of being an awful person, he does he is a very interesting thinker too. Absolutely. That's a, the, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's it's an incredibly fine line to, to take something like you know the idea of so so Heidegger is kind of saying that we're rooted to place, you know, where we come from. Is, is we're rooted to that and it develops it, it forms us you know and what we we're saying before about you know consciousness and and being in the world and, and stuff like that we're very much formed by where we're from um and okay so that's that's the thing heidegger's from germany from you know he loves the forests of germany and stuff like that so it tends to therefore talk about how it is to be a german and you know the, the greatest poetry in the world coincidentally happens to all to be german poetry and, and all of those things so in a sense heidegger is just going okay i've said this about rootedness now i'm going to explore the closest case of that which is me so that's that but it's then becomes an incredibly fine line between him saying that and stuff like you know hitler was saying that you know germans are the best you know that we need to get rid of this cancer of the jews and we need to get rid of all these other races and so forth and eventually everyone has to be german and if you're non-german and you're in germany you have to die or get out um so though that so you can so some have argued that's just a you know a coincidence of of thinking between heidegger and, and hitler so i say it's an analogy but it does make for some quite uncomfortable reading quite often um that you know and you know had had heidegger not joined the nazi party and 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 you know he, he did get out of the nazi party shortly after he joined but you know for other reasons but had he not done that then i think those those differences would be would be seen as more different but the fact that he did those acts it, it then becomes very very uncomfortable um but you know I, I do think he's you know probably you know one of the great thinkers of the 20th century um and incredibly fascinating for those reasons um and but yeah but difficult and uncomfortable and it occasionally flares up you know this, this whole question of Heidegger as Nazi and, and it certainly affected Derrida's life you know Derrida was seen as defending Heidegger not 100% correctly but um and therefore deconstruction was also somehow involved with this you know there is no truth sort of stuff so yeah so it's interesting oh uh, I didn't know about I didn't know about that uh, could you uh, say more about uh, about that in terms of uh um in terms of Derrida defending Heidegger yeah, well, it was kind of an interesting dispute, and I think Derrida was a bit bruised by it. Um, Heidegger, the basically Heidegger's journals and diaries and all letters and that sort of stuff were being constantly published in the 80s and 90s, and they got darker and darker. And there is some stuff in, it's called the Black Notebooks, the Black Books, where he basically says he hates Jews. Um, and at a similar time, coincidentally, um, Derrida, who was influenced by Heidegger, as, as any continental philosopher was, had written a book called Of Spirit. And Of Spirit looks at the way that the word spirit is used in 
in Heidegger, particularly in the infamous speech that he gave at the university. So Heidegger in Being and Time doesn't use the word spirit. Um, in fact, footnotes he's not going to. Now, spirit has always been an incredibly important word in German philosophy. You know, Hegel is all about phenomenology of the spirit. So it's the, the, the mm -hmm. basically all of human existence is the journey of the spirit. So Heidegger deliberately doesn't mention this. However, in that speech, um, Heidegger uses the word spirit and he puts it back with a capital S, the German spirit, you know, the, this is what we're doing, the, the German spirit is carrying on. Um, Heid, uh, Derrida has this lovely section where he talks about there's quotation marks around spirit in being in time and then the quotation marks like theatre, like the, the curtains of the theatre are lifted and suddenly spirit is back. And um, so Heidegger, so Derrida writes this, it happens to come out at exactly the same time as a book which just said, Heidegger, which released all the information about that. Heidegger, not very much of it new, but you know, really coherently in a book, saying Heidegger's a Nazi. If you go, if you if you defend Heidegger, then you're a Nazi or you're a Nazi sympathizer. And Derrida was really caught up in this. Um, in fact, his book was a very slim volume on a very specific philosophical point. Um, but he was just seen as a defender of Heidegger, um, which he wasn't. But it was it was thrown at him, and therefore, you know, deconstruction was always having controversies around it, and this was one of the controversies around it. That, you know, obviously, you know, here are these you know terrible people who say there's no truth, and you know, obviously they do because they're Nazis. You know? So yeah. Oh wow. Oh, there's so <laughs> I learn more and more all the time about all the different ways that deconstruction has been demonized. <laughs> yeah, it has been in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's it's now blamed for CRT, which I know we're going to talk about another time, so we won't talk about it now. Yeah, but, yeah different topic yeah um, that'll be exciting when um, when you and dusty and i talk about that yeah, yeah. Gonna, um but we should we should just sort of touch there for um before we finish on on nature and nazism um yeah 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 the other topic we wanted to cover wasn't it um yeah, yeah nature, nature gets angry at most things he gets angry at christians he gets angry at society he gets angry at a whole bunch of stuff um and it's very deliberate and focused anger um and very witty anger. Uh, he also gets angry at Judaism. Um, and what happens? <laughs> well, and you know, he gets angry at women. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in in nature which, taken out of context, is pretty brutal. In fact, a fair bit of it in context, it can be quite brutal as well. So let's not just completely excuse nature on this. You know, when he talks about things like the Superman, you know, who would who would come and and redeem the world, um, and Unfortunately, you know, his sister married uh, Robert Forster, I think his name was. I might have got that wrong, so apologies to the whole Forster family if I have. Um, so his his sister marries a full-on Nazi, you know, just absolutely no no holds barred. Um, and she kind of looks up in the last 10 years when he's been um, but then very difficult to make taking the job for that. Um, including the biggest stuff that never had um, that's, um, but she very carefully, not carefully, but she does edit his work and she pulls out the full you know, like that she does not come in much stronger. That's the sort of stuff she's grabbing out of it. You know, um, Superman will come and do all this stuff. And I, I, I'm not sure Hitler ever had time to sit down and listen to Um, he may have, I don't know, certainly this, this whole kind of German folk mythology built around it as predicting the Nazis, you know, as, as supporting the Nazis, which, you know, Nietzsche would have been appalled. I mean, Nietzsche had uh, tended towards the aristocratic. He tended to believe that, you know, dictatorship wasn't necessarily bad. He, let's put it another way, he thought democracy was, was pretty crap because it let a load of idiots have a say. And he thought people were it. So he liked sort of a Greek style or, you know, perhaps Roman where there was, you know, yeah. aristocratic class you can get you can get that out of nature yeah that that can get that can go all the all the way back to um socrates and plato's republic and them talking about the tyranny of the tyranny of the majority in terms of yeah. democracy right yeah absolutely yep so you don't have to dig too deep into nature to get to some stuff that's going to support dictatorship and nazism and 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 furors and so forth um as long as you ignore all the other stuff um nature would never have being let's kill all the jews i mean he wrote as yeah as yeah as of course every, every religion he wrote um critically he 
thought there were great things about the, the religions, including Indian religions, which you know other philosophers hadn't written about, Islamic philosophies. Um, certainly not at that time, they hadn't they hadn't written as much. So he 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 found religion fascinating and an opponent in many ways, but also also was on the journey with him. Um, so you know, if what what would happen was, you know, he'd have a, a, a few pages on religion, you know, where he's saying Christianity is doing this wrong and Judaism's doing this wrong and and you know, Buddhism's doing this wrong and da 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 da. And obviously, you can extract a bit which says Judaism's doing things wrong, or you know, right. And, and, and so, which is essentially what happened. Um, yeah. And and, and it, it did become perverted. And I, I don't think the fact that his name looks so much like the word nazi as <laughs> is completely you know helped his cause yeah you know, there is i think for a lot of people that this association was absolutely formed in their mind that nature and yeah. Nazi had some sort of real relationship and the, and also like um in, in in terms of what you just said in terms of him criticizing christianity and judaism he also he also would do the similar type of thing um where he would he would criticize he would criticize like all sides of things and then people would assume that that mean that that means he's oh he's only doing the things like he he seemed to have this sense of german pride kind of like you were talking about sometimes but then he also at other times explicitly criticized german culture yeah. and things yeah. like that and yeah. It, it reminds me too. There's, there's this guy named. So I don't know if you've heard of him because he's also like one of those intellectuals spreading misinformation about postmodernism. Um, this guy named Stephen Hicks, who I think is a Ayn Randian objectivist. Okay. He he wrote this book that I I read called Nietzsche and the Nazis, and his whole thesis was that Nietzsche was a Nazi supporter, and he did all of that stuff. He did all of this cherry picking, right, and yeah. it's interesting. It's interesting too because he also wrote this book called Explaining Postmodernism that Jordan Peterson, who we've talked about before um uses as what he says to say all the stuff all the bullshit that he says about postmodernism so he's all so Stephen six hicks has also been spreading misinformation about postmodernism yeah it's it's incredibly frustrating that that sort of cherry picking thing you know just you know because you, you can reach into virtually anything and get out anything you want to and, and you know Nietzsche, Nietzsche doesn't help his cause obviously because he's, he's a polemicist and is you know and has very firm um arguments against so much of the culture that was going on at the time i mean i think one of the fascinating things about Nietzsche, and i think it's gradually being more appreciated was Nietzsche was a, a real universalist you know Nietzsche, not not universal as in everyone should be the same but he knew he Chinese philosophy. He knew his Indian philosophy. He didn't sort of say Germany is better than them. In fact, he, he was very hard on German culture. He thought it had all gone to gone to hell, to be honest. You know, so incredibly powerful thinking and incredibly good thinking. He respected and he promoted. You know, if it was French, German, American, you know, and so on, he he would respect that. Um, some of his people who he does respect, you you're very surprised by them because you know you, you don't expect it. Um, but you know, it, it also not only pulls the, the words out of the context of of Nietzsche, but often they're pulled out of the context of the time. And I think that's the other thing about any sort of cherry picking like that. You know, to, to take Nietzsche on women, for instance. You know, a lot of um, feminists have seen him as quite liberating because he he essentially says human nature is not fixed, so we can we can adjust it. But Nietzsche says some oh. terrible things. Uh, oh, I didn't even know that actually. I yeah. I I guess I had only heard maybe the maybe the more biased view of him being like really sexist against women. Well, he is really sexist against women. This yeah, like it's like similar to the way he talks about other things, very sexist sometimes, but also like very supportive of women at other times. Yeah. Well, I, I think okay. it's also more that you know that that culture that we're talking about. Okay, so if, if you're a woman in you know, 1880s Germany, you don't really have access to much education. You don't get to go to university. You don't get to go to school necessarily. At 15 or 16, you're, you're off to, to sew stuff. Um, and, and you know he was he was essentially saying you know why are they being so dumb what's going on so you can take that <laughs> thing, you know, being dumb or you're just going you know this makes no sense uh, you know this it doesn't make any sense um, so there's lo there's lots of different readings of Nietzsche and and particularly good feminist ones by people like Arigure and and um, what was it was it Kristeva wrote Marine Lover of Nietzsche because I mean he's a complicated I should 
I should look into those. Could you, uh, after this, uh, after this, send me those uh, uh, book yeah. and authors' names, and I'll look into seeing if I can find those. Absolutely, because I mean it is interesting, and and I mean again, I'll, I'll do a little bit of biography here. That Nietzsche was a complete um, failure with the ladies, um, basically, <laughs> if I can use that term. Um, he fell, as everyone who met her apparently did, fell for a woman called Luanne de Salome, uh, who's an incredibly brilliant woman, um, and she's really worth looking into. Um, and he, did they sleep together? They may have slept together, and maybe he got syphilis from that. Maybe that was his madness. That was kind of the thing. Um, but again, he, he it's that, that weird thing with Nietzsche where he's, he's you know, if you want to analyze him you know he's he's women are, are rebuffing him he, he can't he can't he's awkward and shy and difficult and finds it all difficult and you know just as the way that society was awkward and he was awkward and shy and therefore he's going back to his room and he's writing down his rage in so in many ways but he's you know because it doesn't all fit together the world isn't working you know i sometimes think of him like you know when you're you're a, you're a teenager and there's all these rules around you and it, it doesn't fit who you are you're going i'm, I'm not this person mm -hmm. i'm not that's not actually who I am. Um, it yeah, like, and you're like, and your and your hormones are raging, and you're yeah. like around, you're around all these all these people you're sexually attracted to, and you're trying to figure out how your the worldview that your parents gave to you is different from the ones that you're going to get as from your peers as you eventually become an adult, and you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life, and then yeah. you have to go to school, which sucks, and it makes education seem horrible. And yeah, there's yeah. so much stuff going on when you're a teenager. Absolutely. And and one of the things you think when you're that teenager is the world is insane. Because in many ways, yeah. it isn't. people are going to work every day for their lives and then dying. What's what's going on? You know, blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's thoughts that we, we still have, of course. So, so I'm, not, I'm not saying Nietzsche is, is in any way adolescent in his thinking. But I'm just saying when he sits down to think, he is going from a perspective of the world is insane. Why mm -hmm. are not being educated? Why are endless history professors of philosophy just going natta 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 and writing books about the same thing over and over again you know why uh, why are the passions being repressed why is christianity which was this puzzling thing this huge system of you know of building massive buildings and having massive rules and all he, he just thought the world was insane um and you know it drove him insane in the end because it, it couldn't make it fit with what he felt as a human being yeah yeah that's interesting it's like like i it's true that like when people are labeled as going insane for pointing out things like that in society a lot of that like this reminds me too of a postmodernist or post-structuralist like like foucault and, and derrida like we've talked about before like i think about foucault in particular talking about how you know, this this term insanity, he talks about this in detail in at least one or two of his books, this term insanity, it's just this label that was created by the modern institutions of uh, of science and psychiatry and, you know, the, this, the DSM gets larger and larger and larger, so people yeah. are getting, people, all of these new diagnoses are endlessly getting created and you, you know, he talks of it, and I mention this example all the time because it's a it's an really obvious one. The the term homosexuality, he talks about how that was invented by the institutions of science and religion, and then religion declared homosexuality as sinful, and science declared homosexuality as a medical and psychological flaw. And even if you were like even if straight people were even like talking about anal sex or something, then that would mean that you as straight people were considered homosexual, even if you were not attracted to the same sex, because butt stuff makes you a homosexual. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, th this is the thing, that, you know, for for, um, for Nietzsche, so for, for Foucault, you know, society comes up with its categories to, to feed a particular sense of power. You know, if you that that mat, on one side of the line is madness, and one side of the line is you know is sanity. On one side of the line is homosexuality. On the other side is normal heterosexuality. Yeah, 
So it, it, it yeah, it, yeah. It, this, the, this false yeah. dichotomy, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I yeah. was, I was reading. I can't remember who it was, and I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed. I was just trying to think of it. A, a writer from the fifties, a, a, a female writer, who said something like, "You know, I think that throughout human history, there's been about as many good people and many bad people. There's been as many people sleeping with each other. There've been as many combinations of sexual partners going on throughout all of that entire time. All that changes is the categories." The categories keep changing. So, you know, in Greek time, homosexuality was seen as normal and fine, and then later it wasn't, and now it is again. And they're, 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 so these categories keep changing. And what we what we need to do is look at why the categories keep changing. And, and Foucault would say, you know, who who does it suit? Who and many others would say, you know, who's who's signing the checks here? Who's making that decision? Who wants us to think that this is bad and this is good and this is sane and this is insane? Um, this is and, like this is another area where like where it pisses me off when people talk about uh, like attach Foucault to all the all the like wokeness stuff because I think that it, I I really think that if you if you look at what he writes about he he talks about how people are creating all of these categories and when you create these categories it seeks to divide people and demonize them against each other so I think he would he would probably be more of the mindset of I don't care what your categories on it, it just do what you want to do don't let other people be trapped in your categories yeah yeah absolutely and I mean woke is is a is a fine example of this isn't it that you know mm -hmm. a particular stream of society if they want to not like something they say that's woke there's no, there's no kind of yeah understanding it's, what the, it's like a, it's the same so it, it, there's kind of like a the same sort of spectrum associated with that like on on one far end of the spectrum if you're like an uber right winger anything you doesn't you don't like is like postmodern woke crt and then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum you anything you don't like is like racist white supremacist or something like that and then people can mean people can have a lot of different definitions for all of these different terms too. And then they just assume that, you know, what their definition is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the terrible thing about it, of course, is it's a way of shutting down the argument, shutting down discussion, you know, and that's, that's the base. Well, there's lots of terrible thing about it because, you know, there's, there's often violence associated with these categories and so forth, but mm -hmm. well, the key things it does is it shuts down all discussion, doesn't it? You know, if you say that's, that's, that's a woke opinion, then let's say someone says about something I believe in, then that is, taking apart taking everything i've thought about it everything i've discussed about it every, everything every nuance of that situation and saying it's just that and that's you know that's that's you know disempowering apart from anything else but also mm -hmm. just you know, is leading to a very a very angry world at the moment i think so yeah yeah, yeah. Like, like it's how uh, and and i know like you said we're gonna we're gonna do a whole separate podcast about this but it's it reminds me about what Dusty and I've been learning more and more about lately in, in reading about critical race theory and seeing people going around saying things like critical race theory teaches kids to hate America and, yeah. and, to, and that white people should always feel guilty all the time and you should hate white people. And then you go and read, just like with postmodernism, you go and read these books by the authors that people mention like Kimberly Crenshaw or Derek Bell or countless others and they don't sound anything like the like the way that they're described they're not these like evil people trying to take down society and and like demonize everyone they're trying to they're just trying to solve problems and they're doing it in a particular way which can be one part of a whole nuanced approach to approaching problems but it can be one piece and even like most critical race theorists don't think this is the only way to look at the world and this is the only way we should do this like uh yeah, all this absolutely. stuff drives me yeah, crazy yeah. sometimes we will we will talk about this next time because yeah, I, I yeah. Know, but, but i i do sort of feel sorry for particularly some of the critical race theorists who have just been working very quietly for the last 30 years in a very small part of academia doing this very gentle sort of look at you know how racial attitudes affect the way that we interact in the world who are suddenly now the great devils of the world and you know i think <laughs> yeah they're being horrified some of them must just be very surprised and it's going what hang on <laughs> why weren't you listening 15 years ago when i was writing that very small volume that you know everyone ignored <laughs> so. It's so it's so crazy too like this this category of wokeness is getting bigger and bigger all the time like i saw that i saw that you were tweeting about how kant is being labeled as a critical race theorist yeah. now like yeah. kant was a critical race theorist like how is that yeah. fucking possible 
it's insane. So everyone who's watching this should tune in for that next episode. Yes. <laughs> we're going to end up now, but yeah, we're going to speak about that in a couple of weeks time. I hope. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, we can, we can end it there if you want to, cause uh, I, I, you said about an hour would be good. And yeah, that's it. That is a good little preview for our next discussion that we're going to do with dusty about critical race theory. Um, Oh, someone, someone said here, um, any reading or audiobook recommendations on Heidegger before the show ends? Um, yeah. it, I would say if you don't want to get into his big magnum opuses, there's, uh, I think you can find it for free online. There's Heidegger's essay. I think it's just called something like on, on Nietzsche's death of God. He wrote a really interesting essay about Nietzsche's death of God. Um, yeah. I can't recall any of his shorter works off the top of my head, other than his magnum opus being in time. I don't know. What, it, yeah. what do you think? Well, a lot of the shorter stuff is, is late stuff. And I, I'm not so sure it's a good starting place. I, I, I do think being in time is very good. I mean, you have to read it very slowly. He, he, he does something that some, someone like Derrida doesn't do, which is when Heidegger is trying to introduce a new term, he will slowly, very slowly introduce it to you um, and and will explain it to you. But there's also, and yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head, I'll have to send it through um, to you. Um, there is a podcast which I've been, actually, it's going to be on my phone. If you can bear with me for one second, this is... Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Episode. Um, I think it's Simon Critchley doing Heidegger. Um, where is episodes? My library. This is um, also, the, there's a there's a philosopher named uh, Greg Sadler who I like. He has a YouTube channel where he does deep dives into a lot of different specific texts from a lot of different philosophers. Right. His channel is very helpful. You can like, if you, especially if you read a book and then you watch his video series on that particular book along with it, it helps a lot. Like he's doing one on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. And I've been following that and that, okay. that helps along with like watching a bunch of lectures and reading stuff about Hegel to understand Hegel better. Yeah. Brilliant. This is it. Um, I think it is Simon Critchley. Um, and the reason I, yeah, it is Simon Christie. The reason I can't remember is I hate the name of it. It's called Apply Digger. Can you actually, if I hold it up there, Apply Digger. Apply Digger. Yeah. Oh, that, okay. Interesting. But um, I've listened to five or six episodes of it and it's very, very good. It really does start right at the start of Heidegger and start to follow his thoughts through. So, um, it, and Simon Christie is very, very good. So, yeah, I would, um, I'd go with Apply yeah. Digger. Check it out. There, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of good lectures about Heidegger that you can find on YouTube too, from a whole bunch of like major universities and, uh, and whole histories and people do lots of people do podcasts. Like there's another podcast called philosophize this, which just does half hour episodes. And I'm sure there are some episodes about Heidegger and check out what Greg Sadler has, has said about Heidegger on his YouTube channel too. I'm sure he's gone through like at least one or two of his books and he, he does a great job of breaking down what a particular philosopher is talking about too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, Heidegger is, is, is hard to read, but he's also uh, entertaining is the wrong word, but you do find yourself going into a, a different world and it's, and that's always exciting, I think. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, he's definitely he definitely has some fascinating ideas. So yeah, thanks uh, thanks a lot for talking with me, man. Yeah, this was you. fun and interesting and educational as always. And yeah, looking forward to talking about critical race theory with Dusty. Um, I guess um, do you want to do that next week or the week after that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Just let me know via the, via the normal sources. That'd all right, fantastic. all right, cool. All right, so thanks everyone for watching. Uh, click the like button. Thanks for the few comments there. Um, click the bell to be notified when I come out with new videos. Oh, um, for some, cool. yes, check out an event perhaps, and the the link for the Amazon page is in the description of the video there. And uh, for something completely different, on uh, on the weekend, no, on Friday, on Friday, I'm going to be doing another podcast with Jared from the Wisecrack YouTube channel. Uh, formerly of the Wisecrack YouTube channel, who talked about philosophy and popular culture. We're going to talk about his favorite Nicolas Cage movie called Vampire's Kiss, which is where he gets 
bitten by a vampire and becomes one, or he maybe is just kind of hallucinating and thinking that he does. I don't so we're going to talk about that movie. Um, and yeah, so like I also um, check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description of the video there as it always is. And like I always say, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. And most importantly, always remember this. The funk cures all. And groove is in the heart. And think about Dasein and Heidegger and Husserl and Nietzsche and all their interesting ideas and uh, interesting philosophy in general. And yeah, anything else you want to say before we end it there? Dasein is in the heart. <laughs> Dasein is in the heart. Yep. Really? All right. All right thanks thank again, you. everyone. And adios yeah. until next time. See you then. Bye.